Hello and welcome to Tank and AFE News. My name is Tom and tonight I wanted to talk about the tanks of Walter Christie and their role to a certain point um, in U.S. tank development during World War II. Specifically, uh, countering this idea that I see a lot of times in different books, um, not so much books that are specifically on tank development, but more general World War II history books that will kind of promote this idea of Christie as this brilliant inventor, you know, the, sort of the, the classic image of the the American genius, you know, sort of Henry Ford, Edison type, you know, sort of quirky inventor who has this great idea, you know, but the U.S. military is just too uh, unwise to adopt it, you know, st stuck in their own ways, and instead he, you know, goes to the Soviets and they, they purchase it, and that becomes the basis for, you know, the T-34 tank, which is this incredible, fantastic vehicle, whereas we're stuck with the old crummy Sherman, and, you know, oh my god, if we only listened to Christie, we could have had a tank as good as the Soviets did. Um, that's kind of, that. that's the really sort of, like, crude version of it, but you sort of see that in a lot of different books, and um, the reason I was thinking about it, I was, I was, as I do, watch a lot of YouTube videos and different lectures um, on, on military history and whatnot, and um, uh, Victor Davis Hanson is a guy who just seems like pops up on YouTube a lot lately as far as lectures and stuff. He is um, a cons uh, I think it's partly because he's, he's very overtly conservative, so there's sort of um, conservative media outlets have, have an interest in, in promoting him. That said, he is a serious historian, and uh, he, I was watching a thing, it was about his take on Patton, and um, he had this, this little clip in there struck me as kind of a, um, a classic example of this sort of Christie myth popping in there. So we'll play the clip right now. He was the first person to see that the Christie tank in 1919 had the best of suspension and the Americans should go for it, and yet we didn't do it, and that was the model that the T-34 Russian tank adopted. So yeah, there, there's a few problems with that. Um, and then just to sort of further evidence, you know, I, I don't want to pick up just one thing, because like I said, I, I, I feel like I, I run into this a lot. So just going through some, some different books I have, so I picked up... Um, the Blitzkrieg Myth, this is a book by John Moser, who is, I guess I call him a revisionist historian more, although he's actually like a professor of English, sort of an odd thing to be writing about World War II on. But definitely, I think, it's probably coming from a very di different angle than um, than Hansen. Uh, and so, you know, here in this one paragraph, he says, As is well known, early, early Soviet tank designs derived from the experimental vehicles developed by the American inventor Walter Christie the first man to build a truly fast tank. The story of American tank design is a sorry one, and nothing illustrates just how appalling it was than the rejection of Christie's designs. It was true that in his obsession with speed, Christie built tanks with numerous problems, but his basic suspension design, easily identified by the four to six large wheels on each track, was the basis for all successful post-war tank suspension systems. All right, so uh, again, there's some problems with that as well. Um, so, he, my main point is that, um, Christie suspensions do not in and of themselves make a tank good, um, and we know that partly because it's not just the Russians that adopted the Christie system for suspensions, but also the British. Um, and, you know, I don't see very many people comparing, um, U.S. World War II tanks to British World War II tanks and saying, oh, woe is me, if only we had made our tanks more like the British ones. Um, in particular, the British cruiser tanks, because that's the ones that utilized as Christie-style systems. The other part of the argument that bothers me is it doesn't really give enough credit to the Soviet tank designers that actually made the T-34. Um, and without going into a lot of details, and, and quite a bit's been written on the topic, I would, um, if you really want to get into the weeds on it, Peter Sampson's, uh, Sampsonoff's uh, a book that came out earlier this uh, or just late last year on, on designing the T-34 will probably give you more detail than you ever want to know as far as the different characters involved. But the the T-34, yes, it used the Christie-style suspension, but pretty much deviated from Christie's tank designs in just about every other regard. Um, what made the T-34 good was not that it used a Christie suspension. There's nothing wrong with a Christie suspension, um, which, and just to clarify, 
um, the, the description of the Moser book was was not very accurate because there, there's lots of different systems that had independent suspensions. So meaning, you know, each wheel's independently sprung. Um, the the Christie suspension sort of characterized by the use of usually some sort of like a, um, like an L-shaped arm hooked up to a big ass uh, coil spring, basically that's mounted inside the hull. Um, which gives the wheel quite a bit of travel. It also means it takes quite a bit of internal space in the vehicle, which is sort of one of the problems. Um, the design also doesn't s it, it doesn't scale up very well after a certain point. So once you get into like really heavy vehicles, the springs start to become a, a bit prohibitively large. Uh, and most countries, um, and the Soviets themselves, realize the limitations of the Christie system. Um, and that's that's sort of one of the interesting things, because the KV tank didn't use it. Their heavy tank used torsion bar, which is the system that almost everybody other than the British in the post-war world would move toward. Um, uh, the Germans did not use Christie, but sometimes their tanks get confused with Christie suspensions because they had independently sp sprung wheels, but again, it was torsion bars. So the Panzer III and then the, the, the Panthers and the Tigers, and uh, Panzers I, II, and, and IV or leaf springs, and the Panzer XXXVIII for that matter. Um, so... The Christie suspension in and of itself uh, does not mean that the tank's going to be awesome. Um, and the other principles of the Christie designs, you know, the Soviets, I mean, they basically, the, the, the BT series was a direct, they licensed and copied the, the thing and then improved it. Um, you know, the other things you'll you'll hear about the BT is that, oh, well, you know, it had sloped armor. Christie was the first one to use sloped armor. Well, no, everybody knew about sloped armor. So, I mean, if you know anything about ship design or fortress design, I mean, yeah, sloped armor was a known principle. It was just uh, there was uh, certain different opinions as to how uh, useful it was in tank design because of a, a bunch of different technical reasons. But you know how you want to build the tank, how much internal space you want to preserve, um, and and the thing about Christie's design was yes, the 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 front hull is sloped, but who cares? The armor's so darn thin on it; it doesn't matter if it really if it's sloped or not. I mean, not when you're talking about. Um, uh, the, the, compared to the anti-tank weapons that are being introduced in the, in the, the mid to late 30s, um, as sort of dedicated anti-tank guns are starting to come out, it, the, the sloping effect that Christie's designs have is, is sort of irrelevant because the armor's so darn thin. With the T-34, what the Soviet designers figured out was they're combining sloping with decently thick armor so that it can resist... 37 millimeter anti-tank guns, which is sort of the standard at the beginning of the war, you know, so, you know, because Christie's designs didn't come anywhere near 45 millimeter, which is the, sort of the, the thickness of the front glacier on the T-34, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and if you look at the T-34, it's sloped all over, it's, it, it's, it, it's sloped on the rear, it's sloped on the sides, it's significantly more sloped than the Christie design, who was really only using it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the front the, the bow of the tank, to use a, a nautical expression. Um, as far as other features uh, of the Christie tank, um, obviously the running gear, the, the suspensions, the, that style of suspension is copied in T-34, but a lot of other features were dropped. One of the big ones being the convertible feature. T-34 does not run on the road wheels like an armored car, which Christie thought was an important and the Soviets realized was definitely not an important feature. Um, so that's another thing where the Soviet designers... Um, sort of went off on their own and improved the design. They also made the track significantly wider, which is really the best thing about the T-34 running gear, is the wide tracks, which gave it a lower ground pressure and better flotation on, on the, you know, very not ideal uh, terrain found on the Eastern Front, whether it be mud or snow or whatever, where, you know, most of the other tanks that were introduced in the, in the 30s that were used in, in the Eastern Front, it was generally found that tracks were too thin. You know, the T-34... It really, it's the wide track that's the best thing about that suspension system. Um, and then the other thing, you know, Christie really paid very little attention, you know, to firepower. I mean, his tanks were not very well armed. You know, the Soviet BTs, they at least upgraded to a, you know, 45, their 45 millimeter gun, which is a pretty good piece of ordnance by late 30s um, standards. And then with the T-34, sort of the, the brilliant thing they did, which, you know, sort of one of those things you look back and say, how come nobody else figured that out? To come up with a good dual-purpose gun, um, you know, in the 3-inch category, so 76 millimeter, that can fire both an effective high-explosive shell and an effective armor-piercing shell. 
Um, certainly something that was not a feature in Christie designs. Um, not a feature in most tank designs, period, in 1940. So all those factors that made the T-34 good, those are things that the Soviets have put into the design. The only thing that's sort of left from Christie's original concept is that style of suspension. And you know what? The T-34M, which was sort of the planned, improved version that never went into production because once the Germans invade, you know, the Soviets are like, we can't afford to, like, lose any production, you know, to tool up to make a new design. We just have to keep making as many of the regular T-34s as we can. But that T-34M design, amongst the other improvements, was going over a torsion bar suspension. So sort of the last vestiges of the Christie um, uh, design that was in the T-34 would have pretty much been, been gone by the T-34M. So this idea that just adopting Christie's tanks would automatically lead to a vehicle as good as the T-34 really does not give credit to the Soviet designers that made that vehicle. Um, on the flip side, we can look at the British experience. The British cruiser tanks actually are a lot closer to Christie's concepts. Um, even though they rejected his design, uh, in part because they, they wanted something a little larger, something with a three-man turret, and, you know, they came up with... Uh, the sort of early war cruiser tanks, they still have thin armor, uh, the thin track, the Liberty engine, they, and the, the, the small um, two-pounder gun, which does is not a good dual-purpose weapon. So they're not that much better in a lot of ways than what Christie was proposing. They're sort of truer to what his tank, his tank concept was, which was all about speed. Um, they would evolve and get better. I mean, certainly the Cromwell was a big improvement. Um, and then, you know, by the end of the war, they have the Comet, which is a very good tank in a lot of regards, I would, I would say. But um, I don't think anybody <laughs> would say, I'll take a Crusader over T-34. That, that's just not, not, not going to happen. So, Simply just saying that because you have a you've adopted Christie's design and his suspension system, your tank's going to be awesome. It's, that's just not the truth. And then the, you know the other issue is the idea that because the United States didn't adopt Christie's system or his designs, that our tank sucked. It's like well, actually, by 1942, uh, when the Sherman's in production, we have a tank that's roughly equivalent to the T-34. Um, you know, firepower is roughly the same. Uh, mobility. You know, I mean, they're 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 there's trade-offs. Obviously, the, the, the track on the Sherman's got a little higher ground pressure. It's not as ideal. Um, you know, the, the rubber track on the Sherman's different than the, the, the all-steel track on T-34. You know, engines, you're talking about, well, I mean, the Sherman's got some diesels, but mostly gasoline engines versus the diesel on the T-34. But, you know, they're, they're both roughly in the same size category. Armor protection's roughly similar. Firepower's roughly similar. There's there's lots of trade-offs in the designs, and that's a whole other issue. You could spend hours... Um, later in the war, the T-34, because the T-3485, which is the improved version, gets into the field quite a bit earlier than the 76 millimeter version Sherman, so you can say, yeah, later in the war, the T-34 has got an advantage. Um, but, you know, by the time you get to Korea, the Sherman's actually performed pretty well against the T-3485, so the idea that, um, the U.S. was, like, really far behind or at a huge disadvantage because we didn't have a Christie-based tank just not true and you know it's sort of an insult to Harry Knox who's the the American engineer that designed all those um uh, Volute spring suspension systems um and tracks designs and all that stuff which were very serviceable um uh effective systems they weren't spectacular but they did the job um and they didn't take up any room in the interior of the tank unlike Christie's system so um you know U.S. Suspension system design was, you know, was it the most high-tech inspired thing? Eh, probably not. Um, but it, did, it, it was good enough and it did the job. So they did, you know, I, I believe if you go into Honeycutt, there's a picture of a Sherman with, um, you know, they tested different suspension styles and found that, the you know, there's some things that were slightly better maybe, but not enough to justify changing production over. Um, so... So yeah, let's let's retire that whole myth of of Christie as um, 
the key to success to good tank design in World War II. Um, his designs were very interesting. They were very innovative in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, but by and large, they were pretty much old old news by, by, by the time World War II breaks out. They are, they're not on the cutting edge. Um, torsion bars, which are in service um, from the beginning of the war with the Germans and the Russians, and which the United States got into service by 1944, and things like... Uh, you know, the T-34, uh, the T-34, <laughs> the M-24 Chaffee, or the, um, uh, the M-26 Pershing, uh, or the Hellcat tank destroyer for that matter, you know, torsion bars are really the, the wave of the future, uh, you know, unless you're British and you're sticking to the old horseman style stuff. So, um, so yeah, Christie suspensions, they're, they're interesting, but they do not in and of themselves make an awesome tank, and uh, I, I feel in part... Historians like that whole thing about Christie because it's sort of a good, like, it's a way for Americans to kind of, like, inadvertently take credit for the T-34. We're like, you know, it's really an American design because it's an American guy. And also, Christie's he's he, he got his name in the history books. You know, you don't hear about the guys like Harry Knox that worked for Rock Island Arsenal because he wasn't an entrepreneur. He wasn't out there putting his name out there. Um, he didn't have a son that would later write a really atrocious uh, biography about him, which uh, you can go read my review on my website of Steel Steeds Christie, his, his book about his father. It's, it's a little painful. Um, anyhow, that's my Christie rant. So hope you enjoyed it. Um, probably do a few other videos kind of taking on these sort of common misconceptions about armor. So, uh, yep, yeah, catch you on the next one. All right, thanks.